programming is brought to you by Local Video Marketing. In association with CoachChick.com Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Hockey Nutrition with Kim. I'm Kim Lucard, Hockey Mom RD, and today I'm going to be sharing with you Module 4 of my Create Your Skaters Meal Plan Template, this self-paced workshop to help your skater eat, skate, win year-round. Today's agenda includes why what your skater eats at dinner is important, especially the night before an early game, 
going to give you some dinner ideas for a game weekend. Then we're going to learn why a bedtime snack is important, some bedtime snack ideas, and then you'll be able to go create your skater's dinner and a bedtime snack to use on practice days and game weekends. So why is dinner important? A hockey strong dinner provides your skater with calories, carbohydrates, protein, and healthy fats. Remember, your youth ice hockey player needs more calories, carbohydrates, proteins, and healthy fats than the same child that isn't as active as your children are. Protein at dinner will add to the daily amount of protein that your skater has eaten throughout the day. You want to aim for a serving that contains 21 grams of protein. So protein is needed to build, repair, and maintain your skater's muscle tissue. Now you may be wondering what does 21 grams of protein look like? It looks like a deck of cards. A deck of cards is the size of a three ounce piece of meat. Now that might not sound like much for a smaller skater, this is good. If your skater is a little bit larger, maybe four ounces. I wouldn't go any more than five ounces because when you go too heavy on protein, your skater is gonna crowd out what they need in carbohydrates and that is not gonna be beneficial for their speed and stamina. Some carbohydrates to consider at dinner would include rice, pasta, and potatoes. You can include tortillas for wraps. That would be very good. However, remember tortillas, yes, while they're carbohydrates, they contain some fat. And legumes are an excellent choice of carbohydrates, such as black beans, pinto beans, chickpeas. While they provide carbohydrates, they do provide protein and they pack a punch with fiber. Some fats at dinner could include olive oil for dipping bread, salad dressing, butter, fat that's in the meat or fish, and fat used in cooking. So you can see that if you don't have any added fat, even if you're choosing meat, fish, chicken, and you're cooking, you are adding fat to their meal. A sample dinner could be some beef kebabs. You want to choose three or four ounces of lean beef, some mushrooms, peppers, zucchini, some cherry tomatoes, skewer those and cook them. You could add one cup of brown rice or white rice or wild rice, three tablespoons of grilling sauce, and you can have bread with a side of olive oil to dunk the bread in. A bedtime snack is important to help your skater's body prepare for the next morning's game. I remember waking up at 4.30 in the morning with my sons when they played ice hockey. And if you've got a six o'clock game, it is very hard for them to want to eat a lot for breakfast. Plus, it might not be beneficial on the ice. So having a good dinner and a bedtime snack the night before an early morning game or practice can be extremely beneficial. An example of a bedtime snack is a lean protein and a low glycemic carbohydrate. So a go-to for one of my very high-level skaters was always a Greek yogurt and an apple. So now it's your turn. Go ahead and think and create your skater's bedtime snack and their dinner. Here's to your skater's success year round. This is Kim Lucard, Hockey Mom RD. Happy skating till next time. trunk, specifically your abdominal muscles, are the key to you staying balanced. Let me explain. First of all, let's define the word balance. Balance is maintaining your center of gravity, which in this case, think of it as your belly button or your low back, specifically your lumbosacral region. That's your center of gravity. And the key for balance is keeping that center of gravity over a base of support. In this case, standing. However, basis support 
can be on our hands, it could be crawling, but if you take a look at crawling versus standing, you'll notice that it's easier to stay balanced when you have four points of contact versus two points of contact. So now, let's go ahead and take it just a little bit further. So it's keeping your center of gravity over your base of support. So now, what happens when I go to reach? Well, when I reach, I'm taking my upper body and placing it outside my center of gravity, which ultimately is gonna require my trunk muscles to engage more aggressively to maintain that center of gravity over what now is a changed base of support from my upper body to my lower body. Now it's easy to just stay stationary and not move because that aligns us very well so our center of gravity is very equally over our base of support. But when we add the reach, that changes things drastically. Now let's take it one step further. Let's go ahead and let's take a step. Well now you have a leg and an arm moving at the same time. But you also have a leg and an arm moving opposite. What's gonna control those two things and allow them to happen in a uniform, efficient manner? Our trunk muscles. Because once again, as our arms and legs move, our trunk has to react and keep our center of gravity over a changing base of support. So hopefully that makes some sense about how our trunk influences our balance. But it goes much further than that. Because every time we swing our arms and legs, we create a momentum. And that momentum, depending on how fast it is or how slow it is, is going to dictate how much our trunk has to work to keep our center of gravity over our base of support. That's why moving fast, sprinting, changing direction quickly, is gonna be far more of a trunk stabilization requirement or engagement or challenge than if we go ahead and walk very slowly or change direction very slowly. That's why I always challenge you to continue to be more athletic because it's so important because it's gonna develop our trunk and keep our trunk working at a level functionally that allows it to keep our center of gravity or our base of support. But now let's take it even one more step. Why train with bands? Well, it's very simple. A band is a variable resistance. And as I've told you many times before, that variable resistance allows us to change speed of movement or speed of reps. So now that band can increase momentum or slow down momentum, which in turn allows us to move and challenge our center of gravity or our trunk muscles more aggressively with our exercise program. So if I go ahead and I do a simple chest press, which looks like a reach, if I move it fast, my trunk has got to work harder. And if I move back fast, my trunk has got to work even more aggressively to maintain my center of gravity over my base of support while I'm pushing against the resistance. A free weight is going to stay the same speed. A band allows us to change speeds. So in turn, that's gonna change momentum. It's gonna make our trunk work more aggressively. I hope that makes some sense and why bands are so important when it comes to training your trunk to help keep the, our center of gravity over our base of support. business is Winning Matters. I'm a two-time Olympian and mental toughness coach. I help athletes figure out what's going on in their head, cut through the noise, and release their inner tiger. And I'll tell you something that's going on in their head really loud is nerves. I'm like, Shawnee, can you help me stop being nervous? I'm like, nope, I can't. And I don't want to. 
Here's why. The reason that you're nervous, number one, it's because this thing that you're about to do is important. So nerves are showing you, hey, this is important. Not only that, it means something to you. So of course you're going to be nervous. Oh, and I just did think of a way to stop being nervous. Do things that you don't care about. There, then you won't be nervous. If you don't care, nerves will disappear. But you know what? You are going to care. This thing that you're doing matters. So instead of trying to get rid of the nerves, we manage them. We make those butterflies in your stomach fly in formation. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to understand where do nerves come from? Nerves come from focus on the outcome. We're focusing on winning and losing, scoring goals, playing time, impressing someone. All of those things are out of our control. So of course our body feels nervous when we're focusing on something that we actually can't do anything about. We cannot change the outcome. It's out of our control. So shift, calm your nerves, tame your nerves, manage those butterflies by shifting your focus to the process. The process are things that are in your control, things that you know that you can do. And when you do those things, they make a difference. They can actually influence the outcome. They can have an effect on the outcome. So be brave, focus on the process, choose courageous actions that are in your control and those butterflies will start flying in formation. If you'd like to know more, boom, there's my website. Greetings from sunny Florida. Okay, this is likely to be the last time we'll talk about specificity for a while. We've covered each of the main offensive skills in logical order, from skating to puck handling passing and receiving to shooting. And if you want to consider the other half of our game, defense, I'll suggest that it's all about skating agility or about being able to keep up with an enemy attacker. With all that, I'd like to spend a short amount of time on the way specificity affects the way a hockey player should work on condition. Like every other part of our game, I like to compare conditioning to what a player goes through over the course of a typical game. Number one, a skater has to be able to play his fair share of a 60 minute game, or maybe 36 or 45 minutes if he's a youth or high school skater. Of course, there's an aerobic component to this part of the game. At the same time, here's something I'd like you to think about. I've seen far too many hockey players lose their speed by doing too much long distance running. So I prefer to have players simulate the challenges of a long game by enduring rather fast paced practice. Again, please think about this one. Number two, we have to consider the pace of a typical game. I mean, in general, 
three lines and three defense pairs rotate so that a player works for so long and then gets to rest for twice as long. We can simulate that one to two work to rest ratio by drilling both on and off the ice. And while skating is surely closer to the challenge players face in the heat of battle, it's often easier and far more challenging to them in an off ice setting. Lastly comes the typical on ice shift, which we'd previously described as being a series of coasts and all out bursts. Most high level teams probably skate 30 to 40 second shifts, but challenging players in practice for a solid 20 seconds with a 40 second rest can be quite a workout. Now let me share a concept from my long ago physical education studies. You see, every exercise we do has three components. Duration, intensity, and resistance. At one extreme, picture a marathon runner basically training for a long duration at a moderate intensity and with no resistance. Of course, those conditions are going to lead to mostly a challenge to the runner's aerobic capacity. As for hockey players, they might adjust those components quite differently, going for only a matter of seconds with lots of intensity and maybe even working against various amounts of resistance. Then let me mention one other part of a hockey player's challenge. For during a typical shift, the bursting parts can be quite different. I mean, we're talking about a player maybe wrestling along the boards with an opponent and having to go all out for only a matter of 8 to 12 seconds. Weightlifting can simulate that kind of anaerobics, but so could any other challenge that includes short duration, a really high intensity, and considerable amount of resistance. Yet another part of the hockey player's anaerobic challenge might include some hard skating, that lasting a little longer and probably without resistance, or maybe even with some overspeed assistance. All that said, I think we have to know that conditioning for hockey shouldn't be designed haphazardly or without serious consideration for the sciences. Or should I say, we have to always keep the nature of our game in mind and what a player really faces out in the heat of battle.
What? Wobbly. Different. Good. Oh. Good exercise. Good work. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It is kind of hard on your wrist. Okay. What do you guys? What did you guys feel? Insanity. Cool. Insanity. Okay. I think that's, that's the key. Right. It's insanity, isn't it, Kitch? Yeah. It's insanity, man. It's insanity. All right. So how are we feeling? Do you feel like you're getting a workout? Feel pumped? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go to the beach. Yeah, we should go to the beach. <laughs> right now, notice all of this has been pushing. All of this has been pushing. So without equipment, it's hard to do pulling. But we need to do a push and a pull. Right? Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. You can't just push all the time. You can't just do push-ups. You can't just do bench press. We've got to get some pulling. So this is where you work with a partner. So just wait, I'm going to show you, and then you'll work with a partner. You're going to work with a partner. So you and I can work together. Okay. So uh, left leg forward, left leg forward. Hands here. Okay, now, I'm, I'm going to pull. And he's going to resist me. So I'm here. Now, now we switch it. Okay. So you do 10, you do 10, then you switch. This has been a local video marketing production. We hope you've enjoyed this, and that you've picked up a number of great hockey tips. Please do tell some friends about these shows, and let the contributing coaches know how much you appreciate them.